Good afternoon, and this is CIVE 632 Computational Hydraulics and Hydrology. And today is Monday, November the 8th, 2021. And the subject today is numerical modeling. As a matter of fact, uh, we will be dealing with this subject or covering this subject for the next uh, couple of weeks. We have four lectures on numerical modeling. And this is uh, really the, uh, the foundation or the theory behind some of the things that we have been doing already for 11 weeks. This is the 12th week of the semester. We have four more weeks to go and then that's it. That's the end of the course, of this course. So I am going to open up the, the paper that we are going to be uh, discussing today. <clears throat> Today I have <coughs> I have the syllabus in here. Can everybody see the syllabus? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So the paper that we're going to cover is a classical paper on on entitled A Study of the Numerical Solution of Partial Differential Equations by O'Brien, Hyman, and Kaplan. It's a paper published in um, the American Mathematical Society in 1949. It's a fundamental paper, one of the best that I have read in, on this subject. And uh, not, o not only is it one of the best, but it is also one of the earliest, 1949. That is really amazing since in 1949, we, um, we still people, still just normal people just didn't have a computer at the time. But before the computer was developed, we had a, a whole bunch of uh, workers or scientists that were developing the numerical methodologies. So this is one of the papers. Uh, I am not going to in detail cover the math because it would take too long and it's not necessary. Uh, but I'm going to cover, as I usually do, with the most important parts, the parts that I, I myself um, have dug into and understand the best or the most. I don't understand the entire paper, and it doesn't really bother me a bit. Uh, these people are mathematicians. We're engineers, and there's a, there's a separation in there. Uh, however, there's a lot of stuff. This paper is extremely rich in what we're doing. Um, uh, therefore, I believe that it's extremely important that we re read it carefully, particularly paying attention to the parts where, which I am going to stress or I'm going to uh, talk about. So let me see if I can get this a little bit larger size. Okay, I'm going to read with you the most important parts. And if it's something that's not important or I don't think it's necessary or it would take too long, I'm going to jump over it. I read this afternoon, this paper, and of course I've read, I must have read this paper a hundred times. Um, I love it, actually. So, because it's clear in the sense that it explains a lot of things that we deal with on a daily basis. So, in the present paper, we shall show that the accuracy of a finite difference solution is conveniently discussed in terms of the convergence and stability of the different scheme. I believe that these people, um, O'Brien et al., define these terms for us. Uh, whether we like it the way we de they define it or they name it, that's a different story. That's already defined and people use it that way. So the term convergence has a specific meaning defined by this paper and the term stability also. So Quran, Friedrichs, and Louis, remember we talked about these three gentlemen, in 1928, they wrote a paper where they established the CFL number, which subsequently, with the passage of time, became just the Courant number, but it's the same concept. The Courant number is the ratio of a physical celerity. If there is a physical celerity, you can take the celerity of Lagrange or the celerity of Seven and apply a Courant number to it, to the grid celerity, the celerity of the grid on a one-dimensional system or even in a two-dimensional system. It's always a celerity delta x or delta s for space over delta t. Okay. Uh, 
Equations are parabolic or hyperbolic. They could actually be elliptic. These are second order uh, e e equations. You would recall from your studies of algebra that uh, when the equations were algebraic, we separated or we divided it, divided them into elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic. Where the elliptic doesn't have a solution, parabolic one solution, and hyperbolic two solutions. Well, uh, the, this, the so-called discriminant, remember that word. Uh, but when it applies to differential equations of second order, the same thing applies, parabolic, hyperbolic, hyperbolic or elliptic. Uh, for one thing, the, uh, since we can relate to it, the, the kinematic wave is hyperbolic while the diffusion wave is parabolic. And equations that deal with uh, groundwater are elliptic. So we will have a chance, as a matter of fact, we have a paper coming up on, on the groundwater numerical, numerical solution. Okay. So, um, J. von Neumann, I believe that's the right pronunciation, German obtain the same inequalities from a study of error growth stability of the different scheme. The partly heuristic technique of stability analysis developed by von Neumann was applied by him to a wide variety of difference in differential equations during World War, World War II. Now let's refresh our memory. Von Neumann was, it's been reported, that he was the Hitler's favorite scientist. He was in Germany. And then after the war, he came to the United States, got employed with one of the Eastern universities. I believe it was Princeton, I'm not sure though. And he contributed uh, extensively to the development, that's what he's been credited for that, to the development of the electronic or the digital computer at that time. He was a very smart gentleman. Uh, and he came over here and and he was here, uh, I don't know how many years, I have not read his biography, but he's a great, uh, great guy. I was thinking this afternoon that I should buy any books that von Neumann has written. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to do, by the way. Uh, I'm building up my, my library for full retirement in a couple of years. Okay, so at any rate, so von Neumann uh, uh, developed this methodology, which is widely referred to as von Neumann methodology. But apparently, from what we, from the story that we get from these people, O'Brien at all, is that he didn't write it up. So since they are his, his students or his disciples, they undertook the job of writing it up. And this is the paper that O'Brien and his associates wrote to document the technique, which is widely referred to as the von Neumann technique, which by the way, I used to solve the S curve. At the time I did that, I, uh, I did not know. I did not, I know, nobody knows everything. I did not know that von Neumann was credited for this methodology. I had picked it up from Conch. I wrote a paper, uh, I read a paper from Conch and he was using this methodology and I thought it was, it, it held promise. But then later on, all the stuff that Conch was doing, even though he didn't mention von Neumann was actually, could be actually attributed based on what these people say in this paper to von Neumann, okay? So, with, we begin with terminology and definitions. This sentence in here is the most important sentence of the paper, the coming sentence. Let D, capital D, represent the exact solution of the partial differential equation. That's what we are striving for, D. Delta represent the exact solution of the partial difference equation. There's always a partial difference equation associated with a partial differential equation. The difference being that the differential equation has inf infinitely small increments, while the difference equation has finite increments. That's why they, it's been called, or it's called a finite difference. And the, that's the only way we could solve it because the delta, the partial differential delta is an idealization infinitely small, we couldn't handle that. So the way to do it, you either have an analytical method, which sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't, as you know very well, or you can have, put it in numbers. Now, we before the advent of the digital computer, we could not solve it numerically. It was too many computations. But then with the coalescence of these two things, you know, we knew how to solve it numerically, and then we had the 
the electronic computer or digital computer, which became widely available toward the end of the 1950s. Widely available means just about anybody could have it. I believe I was a student in Peru, in Lima, Peru, in the year 1966, when, where, when they announced that uh, they were going to teach a class in Fortran, which was the, the way to get to the computer at that time. And I took that class, by the way. I found myself in the year 1992, how many years later? 25 years later. No, I'm sorry, 81. So 66 to 81, that's only 15 years later. I, find my, I found myself teaching Fortran. I'm not going to dwell into the details, but I, was, I taught Fortran for about 15 years. I even have a book. Okay, so, so delta represents the exact solution of the difference equation, and n represents the numerical solution of the partial differential equation. So n is what, what we get, is what we get, which is not, it, it's not the same as delta, and certainly delta is not the same as d. So there's three things in here that we're dealing with, okay? Now, we call delta, uh, d minus delta the truncation error. So that's the difference associ associated with the fact that the delta partial, partial delta, is not the same as, as, the, uh, as the finite difference. Infinitely small delta is not the same as the, as the uh, finite difference delta. The, the, the capital delta, Greek letter delta. So the difference between those two is the truncation error. Why? Because we are going to take a curve and we're going to uh, represent it by a whole bunch of points. And if the points are, are not spaced uh, infinitely small, there will be an error in there. You can imagine a curve and a bunch of points. The points are picking up the curve, but there's a little bit of... Um, a space in there that has not been covered by the points. The points don't recognize it. As far as the points are concerned, the solution is a, is a, is a coalescence or linkage of points. So it's not a curve. It is a, it is a bunch of lines, right? So there's a difference in there, That's a, which, it's, which is related to the truncation error. The larger the delta, the larger the truncation error. Uh, it gets to the point where even if you can't pick up the process, then you totally messed up and it becomes unstable, you get the wrong answer. And of course, we have been, over the years, have, uh, have learned by practice to avoid those situations. If you have a flood wave that lasts 24 hours, you're not gonna use a delta T of 24 hours because the thing will, will miss the, the, the system will miss the flood going in, inside one of those uh, grid sizes, right? So you, if you have a delta uh, uh, 24 hours, it would be appropriate to use at most one hour, perhaps even 30 minutes would be appropriate. 30 minutes should be very much appropriate. The issue is the delta, the delta T over the period, which should be large. It should be at least in my book, at least 50, if not 100. It's been told that once you get to 100, then you're okay. Uh, it's uh, uh, Danny there. I can, I can see you. Okay. Hey, yeah, I'm here. Okay, yeah. So um, so once you get to 100, you're fine. And we, can, we have said that before, but we can repeat it now. So the delta T over, over T, over T the period, or which is the same to say delta X over L, which is a wavelength. Although in hydrology, we like to stay away from the wavelength and we go to the period. Remember, we talked about that already. Okay, so... So we call the truncation error. We already explained the truncation error. To find the conditions under which delta, Greek delta, gets to be or reaches or tends to capital D is the problem of convergence. That we call convergence. Um, we call delta minus N, and the third value, the numerical error. In a faultless computer working to an infinite number of decimal places were employed, the numerical error would be zero. That's interesting. We don't realize how many number of decimal places are we working with. Perhaps, I don't know if you guys know, but typically the computers that we're working now, there's seven. They work with seven significant digits. 
uh, which is good. I mean, it's been proven that it's fine for most applications, uh, but it's not perfect. Uh, in the past, we used to have what we call in Fortran. We used to call, we used to have the double precision uh, uh, statement, which will double the precision of the variable. So you could, if you wanted to get more accurate, you double precision all your variables, and you did indeed get double precision. So does it help? Well, it slows down the process, but it does help with the accuracy. I have not seen the double precision being used too much lately. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but I'm telling you the history of this thing. When we started 20, 30, 40 years ago, double precision was an instrument of accuracy. We could get more accurate if we used double precision. I think now that I think about it, that it had to do because the computers of 30 years ago were less accurate in terms of the, of the number of significant digits than the ones we have now. At the beginning, they only have two or three, by the way. They were very clumsy and very uh, inaccurate computers. We're talking about the 70s and the 80s, but that's bygone by now. Okay, we'll, we call delta minus n the numerical error. In a faultless computer, it would be zero. It, although it may consist of several errors, we usually consider it limited to round-off errors. So round-off is the round-off in the, in the seventh digit because the computer has to do the work and it may actually be uh, uh, inaccurate in the last digit. The last digit is inaccurate, it's random, okay? Furthermore, the actual situation, we may think that um, the seventh digit is too small for us to consider as engineers, but in reality, no. Because when we were doing engineering uh, 50 years ago, we, we, without the computer, we never used a computer. We never did these fancy calculations. We never did any modeling, okay? Now we do modeling, we do fancy calculations, and we are confronted, the word is confronted, confronted with the fact that we're going to do millions of calculations, and every once in a while, it's going to go bad. And why is it going to go bad? Randomness. There is randomness in there. And I'm going to um, uh, deviate a little bit in here. Let me see if I can open this up. I may not be able to. Hmm. Well, it's not working right now for me. I intended to show the... Uh, But I intended to show what I had on the board, but uh, the point is that if you divide 100 in the numerator by 100 minus 99, 100 minus 99 is 1, right? And 100 over 1 is 100, so the answer is 100. But if you change the 99 to, uh, in the denominator to 99.9, .9, the answer is 1,000. And if you change the 99.9 to 99.99, .99, the answer is 10,000. So minor change in the denominator causes an extremely uh, great uh, number of the answer. So why am I saying this? Because what happens is that eventually the computation is going to come up with a situation which, which has two numbers in the denominator which are similar. So if there's errors in those two numbers, those errors will have a tendency to blow up the computation. Examine it yourself and you'll see that I am correcting what I'm saying. So, conclusion, very practical conclusion of this whole thing. The longer the computation goes, the more likely it is that it will blow up. Some compu computations immediately within a few computations go up, go bad. That's, those are bad. Those are strongly unstable. But the ones that are weakly unstable or strongly stable eventually would go up. One of our faculty members whose name I don't want to mention, he's not here anymore, he's not at San Diego State anymore, developed a program to do some calculations in the Amazon basin. And he was purported, he once, once talked to me about it, he was purported to be running the program on some kind of a computer that he had for two or three days. And I go, I, I raise my eyebrows, I say, really? You're doing that? 
to me, that is, that is, that is uh, getting yourself into a tunnel. You can't get out because you're doing too many computations. You, you should get an answer within some time, reasonable time, not three days. So how is it that this gentleman was doing that calculation? Well, the process is like this. If the system gets to be, uh, is weakly stable or weakly unstable and it would eventually blow up, you can put in there the so-called attenuators or filters and be able to run the program. Yes, but the filter will attenuate not only the instabilities, but also everything else. And we're gonna be specifically describing that. So you sh one should not abuse that. It's almost like I've said this before. If your head hurts, then you're gonna have a, an aspirin. But if it hurts a whole lot, you can have three aspirins. But if you have a hundred aspirins, you're gonna kill yourself, right? And that's exactly what actually happens in this case. So, so we should be able to do calculations, but we can do too many calculations in the number of days because it'll blow up. Then the only way to, to so survive the problem is to get the aspirins out. And that's not going to help. Now, I should mention to you that a lot of people don't know what I'm talking about. They have not read this paper, okay, and interpreted it in the light of experience. That is unfortunate, but that is the case. You guys know, you know now at least, okay? So you cannot exceed or abuse the issue of how many computations I'm going to do. In computer, in numerical analysis, too little is bad, and too much is also bad. It is your job to find an optimum somewhere in the middle where you're happy that you're coming up with an answer and so forth. And you must know some, you must have some idea of the solution. If you don't have any idea of the solution, you're dead. You have to be an engineer. That's why a mathematician by, by itself is not enough because the mathematician knows how to put the numbers together, but he or she does not know an idea of the solution. This has happened to me many times. I had, um, I should mention this, Summer Hassany, who is now a, a boss out there with the city, or the county, I think, I'm not sure, did a computation for me in the year 1995 and, or 1997, and she was coming up with wrong data. The water was moving upstream. And I think I mentioned this to you. Then I said, no, it can't happen. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And she says, well, I got it out of a software program. I said, that, that's wrong. Go back and integrate it by parts, do from the beginning. And she did it. And two weeks later, she said, well, the software was wrong. There was a plus, should have been a minus or whatever, okay? If you in a long, complicated set of equations substitute a plus with a minus, you're dead right there, right there. It'll come out trash. There's no way. These systems are very sensitive to errors. And that is why those of us that pursue this, this it has to be pretty, pretty detailed and pretty cautious that you cannot make mistakes. So if I said to say, if you make a mistake, then you're dead. You can't do the answer. You gotta get, so that forces you to be uh, careful. And eventually, of course, you, you develop the, the, the capacity to be careful and do these things carefully. Okay, so. We move on in here, otherwise we're not going to finish. Uh, I'm going to have to just go ahead. Uh, I spent too much time at the beginning, but that was important. Okay, so now you guys know there's a, the D, capital D, Delta, Greek, and N. And N is the only one that we really have access to. We don't have Delta, nor, nor we have D. Okay. So, uh, he's using two examples on this. One example is the simple heat equation. He's gonna show a few things, the heat equation. The heat equation is a diffusion equation. And it is, it's this equation here, number one. Uh, d phi dt equal to second squared d phi dx. So it's got, it's a second order equation. It, it, it almost looks like Hayami's, the difference that it doesn't have convection. So it's heat, uh, the heat, diffuses, heat is diffusing. Well, the heat equation, according to this formula, is not convecting, it's diffusing. And that's true, heat diffusion is fine. Heat convection, I don't know, I don't think so. Okay, I'm not an expert on these things, but so be it. So, so we replace with a difference equation. And I'm not going to bother you at this point, but you should examine this carefully on your own. 
how you how you make these differences. Now this one is for plus k plus one to k, so it's above, and this one is centered, j minus one, no j plus one, j and j minus one. So it is like a, it, well I cannot explain it and I don't have a board, but uh, let's just say that uh, this system is an explicit system, and I will define that later on, and and it's at second order, and being a second order, it comes up with a rule, a ruler for this, okay? And the ruler is that, that there has to be a ratio between delta t and delta x squared, because delta x squared shows up in there, delta t over here, delta x squared. So there's a ratio between delta t and delta x squared, which I'm not sure that it is in there. Hmm. Okay, there it is, it's R. The ratio has to be less than one half, right here, okay? So we conclude that the ratio has to be less than one half for stability of this explicit system. Explicit means you can do a point by point computation. If you cannot do a point by point computation, rather, but rather you have to do a line by line, then it becomes implicit, okay? So in a point by point computation, the second order diffusion equation leads to a ratio, a mesh ratio, it's called a mesh ratio, that has to be less than one half. This is interesting because this ratio doesn't have a proper name. I, I've worked on this for 20 years now. It doesn't have a proper name. We looked around all over with uh, uh, Erkan, who was working with us in the year 2001, I believe, to, no, 1999, 1999. We look, we said, hey, this is a number, important number, some like, same thing as Courant, only that this one is a diffusion equation. Courant is a hyperbolic equation. Who invented this? Well, some, well, I mean, you can see this thing has been going on for 70 years, but does not have a proper name. Has yet to be given a proper name. Okay. So that happens, by the way. It has happened and happened in many places. Okay, now he has another equation over here, which is the a hyperbolic equation, which is this, the, the left side is already a second order. So now it becomes hyperbolic, okay? And then for the hyperbolic equation, the ratio of the mesh has to be less than one. Turns out to be that this ratio less than one has now been referred to as the Courant number. Here, he says it. This then is a criterion for stability, Courant number. I don't understand why is it that all of a sudden when R is equal to one for the hyperbolic, you, have, you call it Courant friedrichs louis number. And when R is equal to one, less, than, less than or equal to one half for the parabolic, you don't have a name for it. You don't have a proper name for it. But that is a fact. And the fact that is born by the paper that we're reading. Okay? So let me just go on in here. Now, he, he has now here managed to introduce the, the, the von Neumann uh, method. And the von Neumann method is based on this, on this equation here. Solutions of the form E alpha T E, what is this? E I, Im imaginary. They go into the imaginary domain or the domain of Fourier series, beta X. Now, suffice it to say at this point that this kind of, if you want to call it a gimmick, it's a computational gimmick, is what I used in my S-curve. Do you remember that? I used that in my S-curve. Uh, I was one of the first to do it in hydraulics. Well, I mean, actually, I should respect Kanch. Kanch did it first. Uh, in hydraulics, Kanch, then myself, and others that followed. Uh, we were introducing this. Now, this is interesting because this technique is, is um, heuristic. And even these people, uh, they say they, it's a heuristic uh, technique uh, developed by or used by von Neumann in the 1940s. Now, what exactly is heuristic? H-E-U-R-R-I-S-T-I-C. Now, I know all of you know that heuristic means a technique that has not been demonstrated fully. So, they've not been demonstrated fully. Now, in order to demonstrate fully, and I'm not going to do this, we would have to go all through the math again and maybe hire a mathematician which tell us how is it, how far is it, or how is it that in the next, in the last 70 years, we have come out to define the, the von Neumann technique 
as more than heuristic, maybe perhaps appropriate. But if even if you have a heuristic technique, you could use it. If it works, then it then it's still heuristic, but it works. And engineers have a, a, a the knack to do that. If it works, and based against your experience and everybody's experience, then what the heck, you know? I mean, that's okay. I mean, I don't understand the theory, but it works, right? And it's exactly what von Neumann did, I think. Even though he was a tremendous scientist, he called it heuristic, or he referred to it as heuristic. Is a, is, a, is a usage going into the domain of Fourier, okay, with the imaginary terms and coming up with an answer, which we did many times, we have done many times. Okay, so now I can set the difference between the parabolic and the hyperbolic equations as far as the ratio is concerned. And I'm not gonna go into details in here too much, only then to say that when I read this paper, I was in love with this equation, this one over here. Laplace's, this averaging technique solves the Laplace equation. The Laplace equation in this technique in here is the delta t on the left, partial, partial u with respect to t, and on the right is partial square u with respect to x and square u with respect to y. Never mind u, u is anything in there. Q, it could be anything. It's, it's a value, right? So when you take these two equations, this one is uh, centered forward, forward centered, because it's in my n plus one and n that we call forward. If it, if it would be n, my, n plus one minus n minus one over two delta t, it would be central, okay? Or it could be also backwards. And we're gonna come back to discuss those later on. And this same thing in here, these are in the center because they're spatial, delta x and delta t. So when you solve this equation over here, which is a, a scheme, it's a numerical scheme, uh, the twos cancel with the twos and you end up with this, which basically says that if you wanna solve the diffusion equation, the heat equation in two dimensions, all you do is to take an average. So we did back in the year 1999 when working with, um, with Erkan on his thesis, Erkan came to me and said, uh, Professor Pons, um, it would be good for our project if we developed, uh, if we used a, a computer model for groundwater. So I said, um, well, go look for one. And he went and looked for one at the time the, the, it was, it was the, the computer that everybody uses now is still under development at that time. So he says, well, we got to pay a thousand bucks. I said, really, a thousand bucks? He said, uh, we don't have the money. We were actually working with a very small project, which had to do everything. So we really, at the time, could not afford to pay a thousand bucks, can you believe that, for a model. And I said to him, listen, I got the secret. Let's develop the model. It will take us a couple of weeks, but we will learn and we will save a thousand bucks. He said, okay, fine. And sure enough, between he and I, we worked extensively or I guess intensively for two weeks and developed the model. The model that later on I gave to Jana Da Silva for her to put on the web, which I'm going to later on talk about, not later this week or maybe even next week. Okay, so this is, this is fascinating, okay, in terms of the story that we have behind it. Now, he, they also, uh, O'Brien et al. also talk about the explicit versus implicit. This would be the explicit. And this explicit is subject to a Quran condition. That is, if it's, if it's hyperbolic, if it's parabolic, it's subject to this other condition, this x, x squared, in the delta x squared in the denominator, which has no name. But then if you turn the representation around, you can see that. See, this is partial t and this is partial x. Now, in here is partial x, partial t over here and partial x in the advanced level. And at that point, you have to solve a matrix. And this is an inverted scheme. And it is unconditionally stable. Unconditionally stable. Okay, so that's good. So then they said in this paper that if you wanted to liberate yourself from the St stability condition that you had to go implicit because that's exactly what this thing says 
Now, interestingly, when we read this, I said, oh, well, gosh, that really complicates things, but we can do it. Later on, we found out that that's not true. That depending on how you take the derivatives, you could have an explicit scheme, which is unconditionally stable, too. And that's what we're going to learn in the next paper. Okay? So now, at this point, I'm going to call it quits over here. I don't want to spend too much time on this, and I, we're already spending time, but, but take this paper lightly. You're not supposed to read it carefully. If you do, I mean, you spend months on it. It really is, it, it's like that, okay? So, not months, but certainly weeks, okay? So, uh, at this point, I'm just going to continue in here, and now he's, he's going to be doing some calculations to show that, in fact, he is correct. And I'm not going to get into detail over here. Some calculations, and and, uh, and over here, OK. So in here, he says uh, r equal less than 1 half. This is for the, for the parabolic equation. And he's trying the, the solutions. And he's saying that when r is equal to 0.5, he, r less than 0.5, it works. With 0.5, a little bit less, and then after that, then it blow, it, it, it gets better and better. So the ratio, the mesh ratio, is controlling the solution. He already knows that, or he already, he already mentioned that. So then here at the end now, um, at the end now he comes back to let me go previously in here. I believe we're going to get in here. No, no, not right. I do want to mention Mr. Richardson because he's important for our field. Where is he? <laughs> I can't find him. I should be further down. No, no, we just, I, I, I'm going to go back because it's important. Uh, we missed. We missed the mentioning of Mr. Of Richardson's scheme. Okay, here we go. We now compare Richardson numerical results. Oh, here, here. Richardson is the previous page. Over here. Okay. There's, of course, more than one difference representation. You can have tons of different representations, which is the ones that we're going to cover in next, in next paper. Not every representation is stable. You can have a violently unstable representation. A stable and then uh, uh, completely stable. The idea is to have, okay, let's say if minus one is unstable, zero is stable, and one is fully stable. You, let's say a parameter, theta, weighting factor, you wanna be at close to the, close to the zero, but to the right, because close to the zero, but to the right assumes assures stability, which you must have. If you go close to the zero to the left, you get a, into a, the unstable. It depend on, depending on the local situation, it may be very violent or it may be weak. It's better that it be violent because it shows up immediately. If it's weak, it'll show up two, two weeks later or a, a, a day later, and, and, and then it will be still bad. So therefore, the issue of offsetting, okay, in which we'll cover, cover that later on. Now, he says this formula here of the heat equation, we could replace... Look at this, plus one and minus one. And this one is plus one. So this one to the, the right hand side is centered in space, centered in space. And the left hand side is centered in time. It goes from K plus one minus one. So this is not an offset, explicit or implicit like, like he already discussed, but he was fully centered. So he says this scheme was used by Richardson in 1910 very early, okay? We shall see that the error committed is small. Nevertheless, the difference equation 11 of Richardson, 1910, is completely unstable for all choices. In other words, it runs 15, 20. Uh, we tried this before. 20 calculations, and then 21 calculation, it goes boom, violently, because it has no Aspirin, absolutely no aspirin. The aspirin is the offsetting. 
how exactly is it that all this thing works? What I cannot, I can surmise all kinds of stuff, but I'm not going to bore you with that. The fact of the matter is that it works. You got to offset it a little bit. In the Priceman scheme that we will talk about later on, the offsetting is from 0.5 to 0.55, and that works nice. And that's the that's what uh, Ras recommends for the running of the scheme. Ras and other places too, in other in other solutions of the dynamic wave wave equation. Okay, so we come in here. We are now back in for where we were having already discussed the Richardson scheme. So now I'm going to just wind wind this thing up. Long paper. Okay, let me just say we finish. We have presented von Neumann's method of stability and pointed out the advantages of implicit difference representations. That's cool. At the, at the time, they felt that that was the way to go. Uh, we have shown that the exact solution may differ may differ considerably from the exact solution that the exact solution delta of numerical scheme from the exact solution d of the actual differential equation and so on and so forth. I'm not, I'm not going to read that because we already have already established that. Okay, so that's this is the great paper by O'Brien, Hyman, and Kaplan, which I urge you to review on your own because it's going to, part of it is going to be on the exam. Part of it, not all of it. And the more thick mathematical subjects I will obviously avoid. So, so now we move on to the next paper which is called the uh, Unconditional Stability in Convection Computations. Does everybody see the green page? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, cool. Now, this paper was written in 1979. The original version is over here, right? And I think I already mentioned to you what I'm doing. I've been doing this for almost a year now. I started in, uh, no, 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 the English version was, uh, we started with uh, students that have worked with me for the last five years. And I've been doing, I, I've, I've been converting to HTML all my papers. There's about 52 papers. All of them have to be converted to HTML. We are about 80% done now after several years of work. You know, you can imagine this is detailed. Uh, not only that, but once a student does it and I have to go in there and check it. This morning I went in and I checked this one and I found two or three errors, some of them crucial, by the way that have been there posted for two years. What the heck, that's the way it is, right? That's the way the ball bounces, as they say, but we fixed it, and I, we're in the process of rereading and fixing minor errors on these papers. So, stability and, convex and convergence. Now, at this point, we're already good at the stability and convergence of explicit numerical scheme of the pure convection have been known for some time. Here is the issue, working with this stuff, we discovered that for unconditional stability, the system did not have to be implicit, which is what O'Brien and et al. said, which is what everybody says, okay? Uh, there's people that prefer the explicit, people that prefer the implicit. The, the solution of uh, mod flow is implicit, as I understand it. And when you run in an implicit computation, you need to do matrix inversion, which is more complicated. The explicit is simpler. And when you do matrix inversion, then you run much many more computations and it could mess up. Remember I told you this, that the more computations there are, no matter what their nature is, you can run into trouble due to Randolph, which you cannot control. You can control the size of the delta T, but you cannot control the size of the Randolph error that's given by the computer. You see, so you got to be careful. You have ways of solving problems, and the ways are all invariably connected with these weighting factors and filters that we normally use in order to get out of trouble. You will, we will get into trouble if we don't use the filters. Okay, trouble means that you can't get an answer. Can I get an answer? The stability of convergence properties of explicit numerical scheme of the pure convection. What is the pure convection? The pure convection is the flood equation. The kinematic wave equation is a pure convection equation because it doesn't have diffusion, okay? Unified theoretical treatment is presented here. The von Neumann and Hirt analysis. Hirt was a gentleman that was doing work in the year 1968. Kanjus is 69, 
So they were kind of together at the same time. They were talking about the same thing. As a matter of fact, the paper by her is called, oh, he's got, he's got several papers. Heuristic stability theory to find out difference equations. Okay, so, so he's talking about the same thing. He and, and, and Kanj were talking about the same thing. Here is a little, let me see the, the date in here, because he's got several papers. 1963. So this was a little, a little even earlier than the 1968 paper by her here. Here, her, as a matter of fact. I, I, I believe the pronunciation should be here. Okay. Okay. Uh, von Neumann and Hirt analysis are used to show how unconditional stability and certain other accuracy were possible within the framework of, of framework of an explicit scheme. I should tell you at this point that when I went back to to Colorado State to get a PhD in the year 1973, they put me in a room of grad students. There were six offices in that grad student room, and I happened to be together with a group of people that were getting PhDs at that time. One of them was Professor or Dr. Li, Ru Ming Li from China. And he, a year or two later, after I had arrived, uh, got a dissertation and he developed the unconditional stability explicit scheme. So I had some background on it already. I had heard him talk about it and so forth. So I was interested in finding out why is it that Lee's method works the way it works explicitly. And by the way, he was able to get a dissertation out of it and his method is wrong. Well, not wrong, but not right anyway. It's not right. I mean, whether it is wrong or not depends on the eye of the beholder, but it wasn't right because he was introducing too much uh, numerical diffusion. And that is why he was getting the uh, unconditional stability. So you see, these subjects are not easy. They're complicated. You have to be with it a while in order to understand all the ins and outs. Okay, so the pure convection equation is the following. And hold on to your seats because this is going to get tough. Okay, and it is the first time, well, not the first time. We already done it with Kanj. The difference is that when Kanj wrote his paper, it's Kanj. I can't talk 100% about Kanj, but this work is mine. We were kind of emulating what Kanj did with the difference that we were correcting on the way his mistakes, because he had a bunch of mistakes in his paper, okay? This is not lack of respect or fault in the respect. I respect Kanch, I actually like Kanch very much. He guided me through, through his papers, not himself. I actually, although I did actually meet the gentleman alive or online, I mean, physically the year 1980, I believe. There was a conference out of Colorado, he attended and I met him. And I do believe that to this day, it's what, 80, it's about 40 years, he's still alive. He's in his 80s, late 80s. But he, uh, I have not heard that Mr. Kanj or Dr. Kanj has passed away. So this is the pure convection. And then we have uh, discretized as two. We use the, the eta because here we're using eta as a generic physical quantity. It could be Q, it could be concentration, it could be this, it could be that. It could be anything. As long as it is going to be convected with the velocity u in a fluid. And convection is a first order. And equation one is first order. There's no diffusion. Okay. If there's any diffusion in there, it would come from numerical sense, not physical sense. There's no diffusion in the physical sense, unlike the Hayami equation, which is diffusive. Okay, so we have this equation over here. Now you will realize that this is nothing but a Muskingum with the difference that this has two weighting factors. Muskingum has an X weighting factor, but this one has a Y weighting factor. In other words, he's weighting the derivatives not only in the X direction, but also in the Y direction. We are weighting that. Which, by the way, is attributed to Kanch. Kanch did that. Because Kanch was actually analyzing the Muskingum till he started in generic terms with this equation, and then he says, well, I'm going to make y equal to 0.5 and therefore end up with the mass kingdom, but the mass kingdom only has x equal to point, variation of x. x could be anything between 0 and 0.5, according to McCarthy, and then following with Kanch. So we get this equation, which is, I guess you could call it the, the extended mass kingdom equation. 
So we get these equations, which are the same, okay, with the same that you already seen, where C is the current number. Note that in the case of Kanj, we talked about celerity. We were developing waves, flood waves, the flight wave celerity. While in here, we talk about convective velocity. It's a U for the convection of the constituents. We can talk about concentrations in here, or constituents in the chemical, or rather contaminant analysis, numerical analysis of contaminant, tran contaminant convection, that is contaminant transport. Because transport could be convection, diffusion, and dispersion. Okay, so now we get to the diffusion coefficient. The diffusion coefficient of Kanch. Kanch originated this idea. At least we give him the credit in his paper. And we end up with eight. But note that eight is not Kanj's paper because I had a student work on this and I worked on it too. And we realized that Kanj had made a mistake. I don't fault him, I don't blame him. It was a long calculation, very long calculation. I don't have the record. That would be interesting to redo this equation and then write it on the web. That'd be interesting. Maybe I should do this sometime if I can. I don't know if I, whether I can anymore. But the point is that this equation is correct. Eight is correct. And the reason why it is correct is because we know that when the current number is equal to one, this third thing drops. So we were able to pull out all these numbers and get the current number here up front. Can you believe that? This is a bracket and there's a bracket over here. There's third order error. So when the current number is equal to one, this whole thing drops, which is not what Kahn said because Kanj got entangled in the math and he could not discern the nature of this term in here. You can see it, we can go back, I'm not going to, but you can go back to the Kanj paper and find out that this is not Kanj's equation. It's Kanj's equation on the first part over here, but not over here. And like I said, I don't blame Kanj. It was a very complicated stuff to do, detailed mathematics, okay? So the coefficient of the second order term is referred to as a diffusion coefficient and is defined as follows. That led Kanch to his famous equation, with the difference that the y in the case of mass kingdom was one half. Therefore, one half minus one half, it dropped out. So this one over here was the numerical diffusion coefficient of Kanch. Okay. Now, numerical properties of three common first order explicit schemes. Now, this also kind of reflects back on the uh, on the work that we did for the overland flow, because this was done in 1979, the overland flow paper was done in 1986, so we were kind of building up to that model, the, the modeling of that paper. Okay, so we have these three ways of solving this problem. Imagine you centered in the box, and if you centered yourself in here, forward in time, backward in space. That is the this, this scheme that had been done by Marcus in the late 40s and early 50s. He called it the convex method because he had no way of, he could not, he didn't have any background in numerical mathematics. He could not have done, he was a practical man. As I already told you, Kanch rose through the, I'm not sorry, Kanch, no. Uh, uh, what did I say? Uh, his name, uh, Marcus. Marcus rose through the ranks and he developed this formula, although he didn't call it forward in time, backward in space, but it's exactly what he was doing. Okay, the difference being that he could not get to define the numerical number that is the current number, so he called it C. How interesting, how coincidental! He called it C. But he gave it a, a value which from experience worked all the time. He said C is equal to U velocity over U plus 1.7 in the US system. Thereby guaranteeing that everyone, every person using the convex method was gonna use a, le, a C less than one. Because imagine, I don't have a board to write it. It's U over U plus 1.7. That guarantees that the value is always gonna be 0.8 or 0.7, right? So therefore, always stable and always work. It worked since the 40s to the 70s, late 70s. It was called the convex method. Then the story, as the story goes, my friend uh, Fred Thurr went to school with me and we ourselves 
suffered through all these classes and learned a lot as we were in Colorado State. And then he went back to Washington and he told Bellsville, Maryland. And he told them that they were doing it all wrong because the convex method was nothing but a kinematic wave with an uncontrolled numerical division. And that's why they were getting uh, inconsistency or rather lack of grid independence because the convex method had inherently lack of grid independence. It was grid dependent, okay? So that, that forced them to go in through a soul searching and they started talking about the Atkin method and the story is very long, I'm not gonna get there. But the point is that eventually they, they dumped the convex method, even though the convex method is still around. I Google, Google the convex method, you'll find it. People still, still use or are trying to use the convex method. I don't know why, but that I, I can't tell them not to do it, okay? Because the convex method should have been replaced a long time ago by the Muskingum conch, which is the only one that's grid independent. We know that. Okay, so then the backward in time, forward in space, the number two. Okay, here we have to introduce the, 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 the fact that when the people at MIT, namely Shaki, S-C-A-C-H-A-A-K-E, double, double A means he's probably from Dutch, I'm just guessing. It's a Dutch last name, okay? I think, I think, I'm not, I, I'm not perfect on this. I don't know every last name in the world, but it sounds Dutch. Mr. Shaki, who was uh, American, presumably from Dutch descent, uh, because of his last name. He uh, worked for the National Weather Service. No, first he was at MIT. First as a student and a professor. Then he worked on to work for the National Weather Service in the late 70s, uh, or in the middle 70s. But prior to that, at MIT, he, he developed this number two scheme because they were working on, Shaki was working on the, on the on exactly the same problems, how to solve the kinematic wave equation for the overland flow theory, right? And he had done this dissertation at Princeton in 1965. I read that dissertation. I have it somewhere. I must have it somewhere. I think I do. Uh, you can order. You can, if you're interested, you read that Shaki's dissertation. You can order. Uh, you know, I, I think it's called the Alpha. I think it's called University Microfilms. So, so pay forty. You pay forty bucks and get the Shaki, which I did at one time. So Shaki developed this number two scheme. Why? because they knew that the number one screen was, scheme was kinematic and that therefore it was, a, it was stable only for current numbers less than one. So then he developed, he went on the other side, he went over here. So Marcus had been over here with the forward in time, backward in space. Shaki went over here with the forward in space, backward in time, and lo and behold, he came up with C less than one. In other words, his, uh, his stability condition was C less than one. So then he said, they said in 1973 that we solve a problem. If the, your, measure your C. If your C less than one, use scheme one. The old, uh, uh, the old uh, Marcus method. And if your C is greater than one, and the C is a physical thing, you can't change it. It's physical. It depends on the slope, the cross section, and so forth. Where the C is greater than one, use the use this one, this equation, and then you're running. You're never going to have a problem, and that's true, by the way. But there's an error there, a small error, because the convergent is at C goes to one. If at C is 0.9 or 0.8, it's not convergent, because there is a numerical error in there. You see, it is a small error. The closer you get to C, the more kinematic you go, and therefore you're fine. Okay, along came in 1975, uh, my friend Ru Ming Li, who was my, my, I guess you could say, office mate for two years. And he developed this, he said, these guys, and I, should, I must have taken Lee quite a while to figure this one out, or maybe not quite a while, but Lee positioned himself over here and said, I'm gonna do backward in time, backward in space, and sure enough, his method was unconditionally stable. It was explicit. So Lee may have been the first one that practically came about with a method that was explicit and yet unconditionally stable. And he got a PhD for that, by the way, among other things, right? He got a PhD, he did a lot of work, a good guy. But there's no convergence. It does not converge for NEC, converge to the kinematic wave solution for NEC. 
unless of course you have a very very high resolution uh, the, resol the spatial resolution and temporal resolution being more than 100 or 200 and at that point it was it, it's going to converge because the uh, errors become smaller and smaller but for a typical situation it was not going to converge so we of course argued in our paper 1986 paper that we should not use the lee method because it was inaccurate and we showed inaccuracy you would recall that paper it's a fascinating precise paper okay so now we go to the von neumann analysis and i'm not going to uh, dwell on this but uh i am going to just show you how we did it as a matter of fact we're doing here what kanch did with the difference that is that kanch <laughs> my friend kanch uh, he made a bunch of mistakes or misjudgments and his his data wasn't presented correctly the way it should have been done but since in 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 hindsight we were able to fix this stuff all the errors that the guns did we pondered on them and then we fixed them and we presented in a better way and now we're in online calculation even uh Kanch could not have done that online calculation became available in the year 2000 2001 Prior to that, it could not be done because we did not have PHP. Actually, I take that back. There was, before 2001, the online calculation was very cumbersome. We did it. Actually, we did it in 2001. And then we found that the PHP was going to be doing it in a better way. But we had to pay a price, like Machiavelli says. You can't win without losing. You cannot lose without winning. The... The, the PHP solution was easier, more straightforward, but it was slower, considerably slower, about a tenth of the speed of the previous solution. But the previous solution, very few people could get into it because it was very intricate. And once PHP got out, then everybody could do it. Uh, the gentleman whose name I don't want to mention that developed um, Facebook in the year 2004 out of, uh, where was he? He was out there somewhere, great uh, big Eastern University. It was either Michigan or MIT, I don't recall. But he, uh, he was using these new methods that were coming about in the year 2000, 2001. Without that, he could not have done it. Uh, interesting that uh, Zuckerberg got all that money by putting an application together. And the guys that did the actual work are out there talking about it you know in applications you can see how the application is leads to to riches if it's in the with the right market I'm not diminishing the work that uh, Zuckerberg did but that is a fact he's a thousand a million times richer than the guys that developed PHP which were two academics I believe I could be wrong on that two academics not myself okay so at any rate we have in here uh, replacing all this math over here we carefully done and we need to come up with the r1s and the r2s and the r1s are this and the r2 the r1 and the r2 are concepts developed by lendertsy in working out of the rand corporation in the in the middle 60s lendertsy was a was a dutch gentleman dutch engineer who however or whatever came and worked with the rand corporation in santa monica and he wrote a paper in 1965 on the solution of the two-dimensional flow equations, which I had to study extensively because I was working on that through the late 1970s. So I read and reread many times the Lendersy paper, and it, it was at that point in the middle 70s. It was at that point that I got introduced to these concepts of R1 and R2. R1 is the it's a convergence ratio with regard to wave amplitude. The wave has a is a vertical convergence ratio. We call that R1. And the R2, equation 24, is the convergence ratio with regard to wave phase. So the horizontal errors are measured by the R2. Between the R1 and R2, they, they show or they depict the error in the solution. And as you can see, math. And then we, everything is a function of the sigma delta x, which can be explained, can be derived, explained, or ra rather, rather expressed in this way, 2 pi, which is, comes down from the circle, the trigonometric circle, over L over delta x, which is the spatial resolution, the number of discrete intervals 
for sinusoidal wavelength. That's a fundamental measure of accuracy. If L over dx is 100 or more than 100, it's good. If it's 10 or less than 10, it's bad. In the middle, it's anybody's pick, okay? So L over dx. So now we are going to show the variation across the box. Now here I made a mistake. Professor Bond made a mistake. I said, I'm going to summarize this. I'm gonna condense this. I'm gonna put it in one chart. So this chart in here, figure two of this paper contains everything. That's nice, it's a summary, but it's not good from a standpoint of clarity. It's not clear. And therefore, that is why this paper has not been read, largely not been read, because I goofed. I, in, a, in an attempt to make it clear, I made it, I made it more complex. You're reading it because you're in this class, but I mean, come on. How many people out there are actually, we're even gonna publish this on the web tomorrow. We'll see what happens. But the point is that we took the box, we first varied the Quran number, 0.5, 1, and 2. So these boxes are for 0.5. This box is for 1, and this box is for 2. Then we plotted the, uh, let, me, let me get in here. Then we plotted the R1s, I can't even find it now. And on my own work, I can't believe this. The R2s are one. Let me see, let me refresh my memory here. Okay, let's go step by step in here. A is for L over DS equal 10. So for 10, this, these six boxes are for 10. So in, in other words, cause resolution. And, and B, is for L over dx equal 40, which is somewhat higher resolution. So we didn't do it for 100. So this is these are better numbers. And let me show you how they are better numbers. Over here, you have one, and here 0.99. While over here, you have one, and here 0.97. That means that this get to be 97%, 3% error, while this one has 1% error, because this is 40 and this is 10 in spatial resolution. We did only the spatial resolution. We didn't do the temporal resolution. It's one or the other. Through the celerity, they get linked, or to, through the convective velocity, they get linked. Uh, most people believe that it would be better to use T over DT. But here, I choose L over DX. Like I said, it doesn't really matter. At least from my point, L over, I, I felt more comfortable with L over DX in here. But again, you can relate L over dx to T over dt through the, through the convective celerity or convective velocity in this case. Okay, so we come in here, so that's one thing. What I cannot see in here, yeah, okay. R1 are the top, and R2 is this. Then R1 and R2, barely able to read it, but it's true there, okay? So that's not the important thing. The important thing is that when the Quran number is equal to one, the convergence is along the, along the diagonal. So uh, Shaki was correct. He said, if you can get your C close to one in here or in here, then you get the right answer. And he's correct, 100% correct, okay? But for C equal two, then you're off, depending on whether you're greater or less, then you're off. You get 73% when the situation is very coarse, and then at 97% when it's very small. You can see in here intuitively that if had we plotted the circles, the, the graph for 100, it would look really good. It would have looked, this 97 would have come down to 99.9. .9. It would have been really good. Which goes on to say that, of course, the resolution matters. 100 is a good resolution. Everything I have run at 100 has worked for me. 100 points per, per wavelength, very detailed, okay? The next uh, subject is stability and convergence, and I'm not gonna bore you with this because it's too much, too much. It's really, actually, over the years, I have decided that, that this section five is really totally unnecessary. I'm sorry to say that, but that is the truth. It's fancy, though. It's really fancy stuff. It's hard to read. I'm not asking you to read it, but it is, this part in here, it's too much on the same thing. And then we have an illustrative example. A hypothetical example was set up to demonstrate the numerical properties of the schemes 
a channel 20,000 feet long was divided into 20 reaches of delta x equal, equal to 1,000 feet. Sinusoidal eta distribution varying from 0 to 100 units is specified in the time axis is an upstream boundary condition. Distribution is specified in 20 intervals of delta t, 1,000 seconds. That is, that is a resolution t over delta t will equal 20. And the simulation is carried out for a total of 50 time intervals of 50,000 seconds. A convective velocity varying linearly. We wanted to vary the convective velocity in order to make the system behave more or less like in reality, right? So we, we specify the convective velocity of 0.5 at the upstream boundary and 1.5 at the downstream boundary, meaning we were gonna deviate to one and reduce it upstream and increase it downstream to make it more physically realistic. The results are shown in figure three. Here's a figure three now. Stability convergence of the wave amplitude and mass conservation are maintained. For all current numbers, we have mass conservation, but we did get a, a small amount of numerical noise. Very, can you see the numerical noise over here? We cannot resolve that. We got the amount, the small amount of numerical noise. Since this was a test of a, a pra, of rather a methodology, we felt that it was okay. You're always going to get numerical noise. Don't be surprised. Numerical. Anytime you handle numbers in a discrete fashion, you're going to have to worry or can be concerned about how you're going to manage the errors. There are going to be errors. The whole thing is based on calculation of errors and minimization of the ones that are so bad that you cannot afford to show it to anybody. Okay, numerical properties of three unconditionally stable and second order accurate explicit schemes. When you guys worked on homework number two, I purposely set up the homework in order to show you what unsteadiness or instability was. Even though it wasn't very violent, but at the end it really, when the Quran number got to be 0 0.07 or 0 0.08, it was, it was almost getting back to negative flows. Remember that? I wanted you to see that because it was the first time that you actually get a computation that doesn't work. And a lot of the computations don't work. Abbott used to say in his presentation back in the year 1975, then when you develop from scratch numerical schemes, the likelihood of they being unstable is high. And then eventually you hone them, you control them, and make them, make them do what you want to do. So these are the numerical properties of three unconditionally stable. Okay, now this is what I said that you should skip because it's too much. And finally, we get the answer. We say that uh, this, this, this little wiggle here at the end uh, tends to be concentrated in regions of sharp changes in the third order because we did not handle the third order. In all the solutions, we did not handle the third order. Okay. This numerical error is a function of y minus c and vanishes. So the reason why this wiggle appro uh, appeared in there was because we used the velocity so for 0.5 to 1.5. Had we used the velocity equal to one, it would not, it would have, that wiggle would have disappeared. So summary and conclusions. Unified, yeah, it is a unified, theoretical treatment of the numerical properties of a class of explicit schemes of the pure convention equation is presented. So we prove what Lee, I believe, did not do, which is to prove the sense or the reason for his method, which was an explicit method, to being unconditionally stable. It is, but it's because it has implicit in there an amount of numerical diffusion from the start that you cannot control. It's always there. And therefore, it's always going to help you to get a smooth answer, albeit diffuse numerically. And since in this case, you're solving the pure convection equation, you do not want to get any numerical diffusion because you're solving the kinematic wave. It's supposed to be without diffusion, right? So therefore, the Lee methodology is off the bat not correct. The other methods are better. Actually, the, the, the Shaki method in together with uh, Marcus method is better because it gets closer to the answer. We want the answer, right? We want no diffusion. We want to minimize the diffusion. So for the cases of slowly vary, varying current numbers, the theory is used to show that unconditional stability and second order accuracy 
can be av avoided or can be achieved within the framework of an explicit formulation. So I finish in here, I exhausted my time. So again, I do reiterate, if you wanna get in touch with me for any reasons regarding the, the, the subject matter, you just get a hold of me one way or the other. I'm expecting some homework this week. So I will see you um, on Wednesday and we will continue on the papers that remain. I believe we have two weeks on this topic. Thank you.